So we have seen the cysts of jaws. Now we are going to see the cysts of uh, soft tissues of face. So cysts and the soft tissues are basically uh, dermoid cyst, epidermoid cyst, or thyroglossal tract cyst, or lymphoepithelial cyst, heterotopic oral cyst, thymic thyme cyst, or the cyst uh, essentially associated with salivary gland. There is a mucus retention cyst, mucosal or ranula, and the post-operative uh, ciliated cyst of maxilla. So, dermoid cyst. Uh, what is the dermoid cyst? Dermoid cyst basically it's a tumor. Actually, it is a hematomatous tumor. So it's also known as dermoid cystic tumor or cystic teratoma. Uh, it has been more commonly associated uh, with the tumor of ovary. So it is a hematomatous tumor which uh, which contains multiple sebaceous glands. So in this tumor, this cyst, uh, actually the dermoid cyst is a hematomatous tumor, but the clinical appearance of a cyst. It is affecting all the structures, uh, ectodermal derived structures like the nails, the dental tissues, the cartilage, bone, etc. So what is the etiology of uh, the cyst formation? It is nothing but the sequestration of the epithelial lining that is the skin, epidermis or dermis. Uh, this epidermis, it is like uh, implanted into the underlying uh, tissue. So is implantation of it along the lines of em embryonic closure leads to formation of a cyst, nothing but the dermoid cyst. Dermoid cyst may be seen anywhere along the face or uh, scalp uh, or uh, other regions of the body also. Intra-abdominal cysts are also seen. Uh, there is no gender predilection for this, but few of the cysts which are associated with uh, ovaries, uh, cystic teratoma of ovary, it is a dermoid cyst seen in females exclusively. So the site of occurrence may be the face, neck or scalp. Sometimes when the, whenever the dermoid cysts are congenital, when they are present by birth, uh, they, they may be visible by birth, but may be noticed that uh, not at birth, but after few years of life. So congenital dermoid cysts are visible even at birth. So dermoid cysts affect uh, all age groups from uh, very young to very elderly. If they are like very young, they, the congenital dermoid cysts are present. If it is noticed in elderly, it is because of the uh, implantation of epithelium. Sometimes during surgical procedures also, the uh, epithelium is uh, implanted into the underlying tissues. That leads to proliferation of epithelium and cystic transformation. Uh, these um, dermoids, they present as nodules on the surface of skin or face. These nodules, they may be about 1 to 4 mm or centimeter in diameter. If they are, suppose they are presented on head, the dermoid cyst will be attached to the underlying periosteum. In the picture there, we can see that uh, the child has a dermoid cyst on the upper eyebrow, left eyebrow. Arrow mark points to the dermoid cyst. Okay, when you see the microscopic picture of the dermoid cyst, it shows presence of epithelial lining which has epidermal appendages on, in it and there are presence of ep epocrine glands, sebaceous glands or other glands. Hair follicles are present because all the epidermal appendages are present. So, as few of the times you can encounter hair follicles in the cyst and also sebaceous glands. So the lining epithelium proliferates uh, the epithelial lining whatever is there it also shows proliferation and here you can see in the picture that clinical picture actually the picture is of a cystic teratoma of ovary with presence of epidermal appendages that is in the lumen of the cyst you can see hairs so that is a dermoid cyst so treatment is nothing but surgical excision of the cyst recurrence is very rare and uh, other cyst is nothing but the epidermoid cyst. Epidermoid cyst has also been called by the names like epidermal cyst, epithelial cyst, keratin cyst or milia. Milia are nothing but miniature epidermal cyst. Okay? Epidermoid cyst, the etiology is again the sequestration and imp implantation of epidermal rest cells during embryonic period. So this implantation, it leads to occlusion of pilosebaceous unit. That is whatever the sebaceous gland openings are present on the skin, 
they become occluded. So that leads that at that time few of the uh, epidermal cells whatever was loving off they might have become entrapped inside and that leads to cystic transformation. Then sometimes during surgical surgeries, surgical procedures few of the epithelial epithelium is become uh, entrapped along the dermis. So this epidermoid cyst is basically seen in the dermis region okay. Uh, the proliferation of cells, whatever the epithelial proliferation is taking place, it is taking place in the dermis. So, clinical features, uh, epidermoid cysts are basically asymptomatic cysts. If they are uh, secondarily infected because of other uh, cases like uh, uh, inflammation and all, that at that time only you can notice a pain. So, and uh, discharge of a foul smelling fluid, uh, it is the characteristic feature of uh, epidermoid cyst. Epidermoid cyst is actually shows presence of a punctum or a pore on the outer surface, wherever there is a cyst. Suppose the cyst is occurring in this case, it is uh, the cyst is seen on the back side of neck. So, on the cystic surface, you can see a pore or a central opening, also called punctum. This pore leads to uh, expulsion of whatever the cheesy material, cheesy content of the cyst is there that is extruded out through this punctum. So the cysts clinically they present as nodules or uh, which are flesh colored or yellowish white. Yellowish white shows that their presence is keratin. So cysts may be seen in oral cavity like lips, buccal mucosa on the tongue. The tongue on the tongue they presents as uh, mucosal nodules which are like embedded on the surface of the tongue. So this is are more commonly seen in about third or fourth decade of life there is a middle aged individuals or uh, younger individuals also show presence of uh, the cysts. So when you see the clinical picture it is showing a stratified squamous epithelial lining with presence of desquamated keratin. That is the whatever the epithelial cells are sloughed off and they are incorporated, they show presence of this keratin and infiltration of melanocytes as this is like uh, this cyst is seen in the dermis, right? So, a lot of melanocytes are present in that region. So, it shows presence of melanocytes, melanophages or melanocyte secreting cells, then keratohyaline granules that is showing excessive keratin deposition and sometimes dystrophic calcification of the area may be seen. So clinical picture also shows the same as the histologic picture that is keratin deposition with expulsion of the cheesy material. So treatment of uh, epidermoid cyst is nothing but excision of the uh, cyst and uh, the epidermal cyst previously it was also known as sebaceous cyst but the term sebaceous cyst is actually a misnomer. Uh, it is not exclusively seen in sebaceous glands. Yeah, it did. Uh, there is occlusion of pilosebaceous uh, unit which leads to cyst formation, but it, uh, the term sebaceous cyst uh, for this is wrong. Then another common uh, soft tissue cyst is a thyroglossal duct cyst. It is actually, it arises because of entrapment or of, of uh, epithelium along the thyroglossal tract. We know there is uh, the primitive thyroid gland, it descends from the base of the tongue to its position near the high, hyoid bone. Along this region there exists a tract called the thyroglossal tract. Normally this thyroglossal tract degenerates. So if, if the thyroglossal tract remnant is present and if it undergoes dilatation, uh, if, the, if there is failure of closure of thyroglossal tract, it leads to thyroglossal duct cyst formation. So it is uh, frequently this is seen in younger individuals below 20 years of age and the thyroglossal six may have developed but the patient may have noticed it after a decade like that. So it presents as an asymptomatic midline neck mass. So it uh, the as we all know the thyroid gland descends near the hyoid bone. So this thyroid gla uh, thyroid glossal duct cyst it presents as a neck mass, it moves with swallowing which you can, uh, which is the diagnostic feature clinically. It is just palpable and sometimes the cyst may be infected. So the neck mass moves with swallowing and the patient uh, has sometimes uh, complaints of difficulty in swallowing or difficulty in speaking. 
dysphagia and uh, this uh, cyst might have developed but it remains dormant uh, for uh, about a decade then you may notice it only when it is secondarily infected by other infections. So clinical picture is this and then you see microscopically the cyst shows presence of a lining epithelium that is the stratified squamous epithelium and the connective tissue wall it shows presence of both the thyroid tissue, the lymphoid tissue and mucus glands. Treatment for uh, thyroglossal duct cyst is you have to excise the cyst along with the tract. So remnant of this tract may lead to recurrence of the cyst. So thyroglossal tract along with cyst is excised. That is nothing but the cyst trunk operation. Sometimes because this is attached to the hyoid bone, a portion of hyoid bone also might have to be uh, just removed surgically. So that is about the thyroglossal duct cyst. Now the heterotopic gastrointestinal cyst. It is relatively uncommon uh, soft tissue cyst. It is actually the entrapment of gastric mucosa on in other places. Normally gastric mucosa is seen in the stomach, the intestines. Well, sometimes what happens is the gastric mucosa may be seen in oral mucosa, tongue, floor of the mouth uh, and other places where normally you cannot expect the gastric mucosa. So the, 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 that leads to formation of a that, that places wherever you encounter a cyst which is lined by this gastric mucosa it is called as the heterotopic gastrointestinal cyst. It probably arises because of misplaced embryonal rest. So sometimes the embryonic during the embryonic period the cells of gastric mucosa might have misplaced to other areas like the oral cavity. At that places if the epithelial cells proliferate and lead to cystic formation it forms this gastrointestinal cyst which is heterotopic in nature. So clinically you can see this in children or young adults and they present as small nodules entirely within the body of tongue or floor of the mouth or in buccal mucosa, uh, just uh, small nodules like thing. Uh, they do not cause any pain or uh, swelling like that, uh, just few mm in uh, diameters and their uh, difficulty in speaking or eating may be encountered. if. Uh, the nodules are of relatively larger in size or they are in such places like in the floor of the mouth or in the tongue uh, where you are uh, having uh, difficulty in mastication is that area is being repeatedly traumatized in that cases only it, uh, you can consider a surgical excision of the cyst. Histologic features are only diagnostic of this type of cyst. Because clinically when you see a nodule you cannot tell that that has been derived from gastric mucosa right. So histologic features when you see microscopically the lining epithelium is a stratified squamous epithelium partly and partly it shows the gastric mucosa and the presence of the parietal cells or chief cells which are seen in the gastric mucosa and mucus secreting cells may also be seen. So treatment is surgical excision only if it is of such a size that it is causing trauma to you. Normally uh, these uh, kind of cysts go unnoticed. Then uh, another uh, commonly encountered soft tissue cyst is a lymphoepithelial cyst. Lymphoepithelial cysts are uh, nothing but cysts arising in the normal lymphoid aggregates. We know that normally lymphoid aggregates are seen in the posterior surface of tongue that is in the tonsillar region that, that is the place where normal lymphoid aggregates are present. If uh, the lymphoid aggregates may also be seen in other areas like the buccal mucosa or the tongue. So at that places if uh, cyst formation takes place by entrapment of the cells. What happens is whenever a lymphoid aggregate is there it shows presence of a crypt, crypt or a depression and uh, in this depression the deposition of keratin, keratin accumulates at that place that leads to cyst formation eventually. So this lymphoid, uh, lymphoepithelial cyst, it, uh, it develops within a benign lymphoid aggregate. That uh, lymphoid aggregate is considered normal actually. But because of uh, deposition of keratin and subsequently the keratin just sloughs off the epithelium and eventually it leads to cystic formation. Clinically it presents as a painless submucosal nodule with uh, yellowish discoloration. It is about 0.5 diameter, 0.5 centimeter in diameter. 
very small in size and nodular presentation which is movable. So, as I told you this uh, the lymphoid aggregate shows crypt with keratin deposition. The keratin eventually sloughs off from the epithelial surface. So, there is cyst rupture to release the ca cheesy keratinaceous material into the oral cavity. So, when you see a microscopic picture of the cyst, uh, it shows presence of an epithelial lining which is atrophic. So, it, there are no retapex, there is no hyperplasia in that tissue and because it is occurring in a lymphoid aggregate, uh, it shows presence of lymphoid tissues and uh, excessive deposition of the keratin which is sloughing off from the epithelial surface. And a uh, few of the time they show presence of mucus secreting cells like the goblet cells also. Treatment is nothing but conservative surgical excision. Lymphoepithelial cyst is a relatively rare lesion, very very rarely you can just see this lesion. Uh, thymic cyst is another soft tissue cyst seen. Actually what happens is after the development of thymus gland, after the disin, uh, thymus gland descends from its place of origin, uh, the thymopharyngeal duct should degenerate. The persistence of this duct leads to a tract formation again and epithelial cells become entrapped along this line and again they lead to cystic formation. That is nothing but the thymic cyst. It is seen in the lateral uh, neck region, lateral side of the neck. So, these lesion uh, they present as swellings and uh, on the lateral area of the neck treatment for this is nothing but surgical excision of the tract. So, then we are going to the soft uh, cysts associated uh, with the maxillary antrum. Uh, these are nothing but the uh, cysts which are seen uh, few of the cysts like the sinus mucosal it is seen in association with the maxillary sinus then the post operative maxillary cyst that is the surgical ciliated cyst of maxilla uh, that is also seen in association with maxillary sinus and the mucosal and the retention cyst are the commonest cysts associated with salivary gland function. So, uh, so mucosal, mucosal uh, it is a very common lesion mucosal is also known as a mucus retention phenomena. Uh, actually, it is. it was previously thought to be due, arising due to obstruction of salivary gland duct, submaxillary or the submandibular gland ducts. Then few of the authors, uh, they proposed that traumatic severance of the salivary duct. That is whenever the salivary duct is excised or injured because of trauma, there appears to be mucus pooling in the surrounding tissue. This leads to formation of a cyst. So, this uh, traumatic severance of the salivary duct may, be, may occur because of biting of lips or cheeks or uh, factitial injuries or pinching of the lips by forceps during extraction. All these lead to injury to the ductal tissue. So, whenever there is a severance of the duct, plasma pooling of the saliva is noticed, then this leads to formation of cyst. Mucosils are basically of two types, extravasation mucosil and retention mucosil. Retention mucosil is a trosis, that is it is lined by epithelium. Extravasation is not a trosis, there is absence of epithelium there. It is a pseudocyst. So, mucosil is commonly seen on the lip, palate, cheek or tongue. Most commonly encountered region is the lower lip region. Uh, upper lip, the rare Rarely it is encountered in the upper lip. Upper lip show more of uh, presence of neoplasms. Okay. So the lesion appears as a the lesion appears as a uh, superficial lesion or a deep lesion. The superficial lesion is nothing but a raised circumscribed vesicle. It appears as a vesicle uh, because of when you illuminate it with light and see it appears as a bluish translucent lesion. Sometimes the lesion may be deeply situated. The deeply situated lesion arises as a swelling on the oral mucosa. Because the lesion is de deeply situated, the overlying mucosa appears to be of normal color. So, because the lesion is arising because of trauma and whenever uh, there is trauma to the area of mucosal, this uh, whatever mucus pooling is there, it is relieved and uh, the lesion regresses. Because uh, the lesion is uh, regressed because of incision, that is 
again trauma occurs to the mucosal, the whatever content of cyst is there, it is liberated. There are higher chances of recurrence. So to prevent recurrence, uh, the treatment for mucosal is complete excision of the lesion. So these are the clinical features of the lesion. Okay. Clinically, uh, after clinical diagnosis, we are going for the histological features. Histologic features, uh, the cavity, as I said, the extravasation mucosal, it is more common type, it is not lined by epithelium, it is a pseudocyst type. The epithelium is absent, we can say the epithelium is absent, yeah. The, the presence of connective tissue is there which shows more of fibroblasts and the lumen of the cyst is filled with isnophilic coagulum, keratocytes and polymorphonuclear leukocytes, denoting inflammation. And uh, when you see the lumen of the uh, cyst, the cyst has a content of mucinous fluid because it is of saliva pooling, right? So there are a lot of mucinous contents in that. Sometimes uh, a flattened epithelial lining is seen histologically. This epithelial lining, as we know that the mucosal arises because of severance of the excretory duct, this flattened epithelial lining is nothing but the uh, ductal epithelium. So that's why it is known as epithelium of feeder duct. So treatment is excision. If the lesion is incised or just the contents are relieved, there are higher chances of recurrence. So complete excision of the gland should be carried out complete excision of the uh, mucosal should be carried out. So this ranula, ranula is the other physical injury. It is also a form of mucosal, but ranula has a specific feature that the mucosal occurs only on the floor of the mouth, that is the below the tongue region. Etiology is nothing but uh, obstruction of the salivary gland duct. Most commonly the submandibular gland duct, it is obstructed by presence of some ductal stones, silolithiasis, so and uh, trauma, all this lead to ductal blockage and formation of a mucosal. Again clinically the lesion appears as a slowly enlarging painless mass, okay, uh, it is slowly enlarging, so it takes few months to develop. So once it has developed it may be of again two types, superficial and the deep lesion, superficial lesion appears uh, on illumination it appears as a bluish translucent cast like structure whereas the deep lesion it is like deeply situated so the overlying mucosa will be normal in color. So because it appears in the floor of the mouth and it is a very large mass the tongue of, uh, is elevated. So histologic features here the definite epithelial lining may be present sometimes or it may be absent sometimes it is present only when the a uh, lining of excretory duct is seen uh, as histologically and it is a true retention cyst okay, because of presence of epithelial lining. Treatment is nothing but excision of the sublingual gland or marsupialization. So we have seen mucosal, uh, mucosal is a form of physical injury uh, occurring in the uh, occurring because of injuries to the ducts of salivary glands. Okay either traumatic injury or blockage or obstructions. Okay. Now we will see the retention cyst of maxillary sinus. Retention cyst of maxillary sinus is nothing but the mucosal cyst of maxillary sinus. Here the cyst is seen very closely approximated to the maxillary sinus. Uh, clinically no features of uh, pain or swelling may be seen occasionally the buccal expansion uh, may be seen, but the patient will not give you a history of pain. So it is the asymptomatic swelling, it is incidentally discovered on radiographs. So whenever you take a radiograph, it appears as a radiolucent area, completely filling the maxillary sinus. So well defined homogeneous dome shaped radiopacity, normally maxillary sinus is radiolucent, but when the retention cyst develops, it appears as a radio, radio opaque region. So you here you can see the radiological picture. If you see the right side of the picture, it shows the presence of a radio opaque. The bluish color uh, uh, colored indicator is nothing the cyst, radio opaque cyst 
this cyst is very closely approximated to the maxillary sinus. Okay, so the lining of maxillary sinus epithelium may be seen in the cyst. It is a pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium, or sometimes no definite lining may be seen. Accumulation of fluid occurs within the connective tissue uh, because it is uh, the sinus epithelium, it secretes the mucus. So, accumulation of fluid occurs and there is uh, it is a non secretory cyst and the treatment is cyst is either unchanged or disappears spontaneously. That is the cyst may persist for a longer period of time or it may regress spontaneously. Mostly this cyst arises as a result of allergy or sinusitis or traumatic uh, extractions. Traumatic extractions are the cause of this cyst. It regresses spontaneously or uh, it may remain like that only.